right. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever we are in the world. Thank you for joining. We'll leave a couple more minutes just for a few more to show up, and then we'll kick into it. Whoa, it's Dylan. Out of nowhere. Look, look at that. I've just been looking through the um the pictures in the uh, screenshot competition channel. There's some awesome ones in there. Yeah, the building as well. There's a couple in there that have really blown me away. A lot more people here understand physics, and I don't. I'm going to turn on my camera so that people know I'm real, but I don't know how to in Discord. I'm actually unsure if you can in the new stage of setup, but find out. Awesome. Cool. So while people join, I'll give a quick um, rundown of how this will work. Um, I will run through a bunch of the questions we've had in the AMA chat over the last uh, few days. I'll pick out a bunch that um, are really good ones for us to chat about, things that you guys have some thoughts on, some really popular ones. And at the end, I'll fire off a few speed round questions that you guys can answer quickly. Um, go for about an hour or so, depending on how we go. And uh, yeah, we'll go from there. So Sweet. do you guys want to quickly introduce yourselves first? So I think most people would know who you are, but for the sake of some of our new members. You can start, Dylan. <laughs> um, I'm Dylan, or Heightmare. Uh, I am now the executive producer for Icarus. Um, you probably normally just see me in Discord getting asked politely in the late hours of the night to release the uh, the beta weekend builds early. Um. I'm Dean, otherwise known as Rocket, so I'm uh, what we call a game runner, uh, which uh, Dylan, our hype mayor, actually sort of semi came up with. So essentially my role is to have the financial and creative authority, so very similar as to how uh, it's done in, say, you know, film, television, well, television and stuff like that, so... It basically means that if needed, I can come in and break a deadlock and 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 put make sure things are being pushed in the right way. So a lot of my role has been focused on figuring out how we should do things and how we should approach things, and then just making sure that things get nudged along in that direction. Nice, uh, very good. Um, so yeah, we've got um, some great questions from the community for you guys to jump into today. Um, so I'll kick us off with a few. Um, if you sure want at the start, a good one here from Bacon Particles. How many more missions will be offered at launch compared to what was already seen in the beta weekends? Wants to cover that one. Me? Yeah, sure. Um, I think the the general approach has been to try and figure out uh how we should approach handling the missions. And I think people would have seen as we went through uh the beta weekend periods, we kind of experimented with different ways of doing missions and then sort of honed in uh, and basically what we've provided for here. And and I think we we kind of want to expand with that. So I think for us, it's less about uh, quantity and a little bit more about quantity in terms of, sorry, uh, it's less about quantity and much more about quality in terms of what basically delivers us through to that experience. So what we really want to do is is try and provide stuff that gives you uh, provide missions that give you a really compelling reason to come back in and try a different area or a different approach or, or something like that in, in Icarus. So, so we haven't really been focusing massively on, on hey, we need to achieve this particular uh, quantity. It's, it's really been more about what are the types of missions we can do. And then I think uh, even beyond 1.0, it'll be about it, um, continue, continuing to expand upon that as well. I don't know if you, you wanted to add anything to that, Dylan. Yeah, so the way we're getting a lot of them in is, um, you know, after deciding on sort of the structure, uh, the designers have got the um, have got quite a quite a long list. I mean, the the list might be different on the last day, but we're we're looking at sort of dozens. Um, but they're all they're all sort of they start out with putting the thin version of the mission in and then building the the detail into it as we go. So um, yeah, that's that's kind of that point you were talking about about building quant uh, quality into them. Um, it's just going to be something that we're doing right up to release. And, and and a lot of it as well is about what works with the game. So that, that's been a big focus. And, and often we'll be like, hey, uh, um, 
this will be a really cool mission to do or this will be a really cool thing to do and we try it out and we just don't like it and and we just don't think it's uh you know any good uh and so it won't it won't make it in or or it'll be changed or something like that awesome that's great um and they kind of leads a little bit into as we talk about the future this here from december um, with the change from the free to play to uh, um, cash out to a purchase game, how will the future additions be handled? Uh, will I still be able to buy extra character slots to have more than three? Uh, he's personally gunning for a disco shaped ball shaped dropship. So, a bit of a broad question, wasn't specific. Uh, look, one of the, I suppose, I'll say cool things about dropping the free to play side of it meant that uh, we didn't sort of really have to invest a lot of time into figuring out monetization and stuff like that because you do the monetization up front by just getting uh, money from customers and, and then that's what you use to, to make the game. So you don't have to kind of uh, agonize over, oh, will people get upset if we monetize this and, and delve into all that. I still think it would have been cool if we'd been able to, uh, to, to do it, more just from the challenge that no one had really sort of made a a free to play survival game like this. So and it's always nice to do things that or try to do things that people haven't done before. But I think it it removed a lot of complexity and a lot of problems uh that I think people saw that we were heading towards. And imagine if we were trying to make the game and do all this stuff at the same time as figure out uh how do we how do we monetize it? How do we make sure we don't run out of money? Uh, you know, by hiring too many people, but but the game not uh, you know selling as well because it can take years to to make money from a free to play game. So that's a long winded way of saying we haven't really thought a lot about additional content type stuff. I suppose I'm kind of reluctant myself because I think in many ways adding in hey pay this money to get this uh, it can often throw up more problems than it makes you in money. Uh, so I, I think I'm approaching that from a pretty cautious standpoint. I think it is useful, and I think if you look at our other products like uh, Stationers and stuff like that, I think we could do better as a studio at figuring out how to how to uh, make a bit more from our games and stuff like that because yeah, you know, it allows you to make better games and bigger games and and stuff like that and get a, bit, a bigger team and a better team. So. I think it's something we'll look at, but I, I think it's it's being approached with extreme caution. And even though people have bought it up internally, I've kind of hand waved it away because I uh, the the phrase that I use a lot is the game comes first, and that means several things. It means that we're not focusing too much on the monetization because people just buy the game and that's kind of done there. Uh, and the and the second part of that. Is is not necessarily as good as the com- community, uh, good for the community, which means that we we also focus a lot on what's necessary for the game. So that's why, like, I've been able to stream as much uh, or at all, uh, and um, and stuff like that. And and maybe you know we're really slow with getting the supporters edition set up and all those kinds of things. There, it's really because we are just fully focused on the game, and a lot of time will get put into the game and. Sometimes other things we need to do uh, aren't done as a result. Cool, that's awesome. Um, so I didn't six. even uh, I didn't really answer the question. We, <laughs> we haven't actually got specific plans for that kind of stuff, so it's sort of a it's a a gentle no uh, for the moment. Uh, just because we're really focused on getting the game right, I, I think too many games have been destroyed by poor monetization. And I think survival games are particularly susceptible to this problem because it's very much about gathering resource and progression and stuff like that. And yeah, so we're going to be, I think, pretty cautious around that front. It'd be cool if we could do something, though, because I think there is some interesting um, interesting approaches with monetization from some games, but I think we'll be pretty gentle with it. Awesome. Cool. So that kind of um, talks into a bit more to the content. So this question will fit here, which is um, from Andrew. What kind of content updates can we expect between the DLC chapters? I um, kind of thought this was going to be part of that last one. Um, you can go for it, Dean. Sorry. No, you were you going to go for it? Well, I was going to say the um the you know a, a lot of one of the things we're going to be spending a lot of time looking at post release is is um how to sort of work in 
you know, we're going to be doing a lot of content updates that are um, that are happening outside of the the work towards um, sort of one of those first chapter releases with um, uh, Dangerous Horizons and, and New Frontiers. But the um, it, 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 we'll have to content could across the board be be added in those updates it'll take us a while to sort of get the right cadence on on sort of figuring out how much the team can do um during one of those periods and the sort of things the players want um because i know that the designers for sure will have all sorts of things that they will continue to want to add after release um, that we'll, we'll probably just continue doing yeah for me it's only really about getting this has been really about getting started and I'll kind of segue this question into something I think is pretty important to point out. We've tried to use the beta period for what I think a beta is really good at, which is to sort of experiment with something with a game that's almost done. So we've done the broad architecture, but sort of how you put it together and how you balance it and how you approach some things is, is, wasn't nailed down and it's changed a lot in a very small space of time. We spend a lot of time developing the project to do that. And it's important that process doesn't go on too long. I saw some really good people having a discussion on one of the subreddits about how, uh, and I'm paraphrasing pretty badly, but that they were pointing out that as players that we were assessing the game, playing it sort of wrong through the beta because people's progress was getting lost uh, regularly. And... Uh, you were kind of approaching it fresh. So that would often make the game seem a lot more frustrating than it necessarily would otherwise if you were just coming into it after the game launches. I think it's a really good point. And that's why I think if the betas, uh, if the beta run, run on too long, we start to draw the wrong conclusions uh, because the game's just getting changed constantly. So with the end of the beta period, we've kind of solidified the game down. And that's when we can actually pump in new content uh, in a much more, not necessarily a relaxed fashion, but in a much more confirmed way because the game's not changing all over the place. You can sort of imagine how difficult it is for us, our art team and our audio team and that at the moment, to be trying to add content to the game uh, when the game is changing all the time. Uh, and yeah, so so I guess we have pretty big, I think, and exciting plans for additional content that are enabled by us you know, ending that beta period and, and starting to look and focus at uh, uh, the game as a, a, I suppose, solidified thing. Mm. Oh, awesome. That's great. Um, here's a group for um, game going in the future from uh, Landford. How much more alien will the planet get? Yeah, so it's, it's something that's been brought up a lot and it's you know something that we, we always want to do and like to do. But I think a good art in a game is about consistency and uh, making sure that the, the art all stitches together well. And we wanted to kind of take the player from a place of familiarity and then drag them into something else because I think that makes it, uh, you know, that does all the emotional hooks about getting you into the game and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah. Uh, it's something we do want to introduce, uh, and and we will see you know coming in over time. Um, and you've already seen it with the, you know, the sandworm and and stuff like that. So, uh, we're kind of introducing it and on the edges, as it makes sense with the lore and stuff like that too. Awesome. All right, so here's a good one that goes a bit more into specifics around the fa um, fauna and flora. Um, for, again, from Andrew, is Icarus is a home to a variety of mammals, but it's apparently devoid of other taxonomic kingdoms like birds and reptiles. Will there be additional phyla added aside from fish? Will we see more species? In terms of... So I guess if we consider what we have now, are we are likely to see more species such as birds, reptiles, you know, other things you might expect in a more Earth-like biome? How much are we saying, Dylan? <laughs> I don't know. You're the game runner. <laughs> um, yeah, de definitely. So uh, the only reason I'm a little reluctant is because we have to try, uh, you know, try some things out and see how they work. So, for example, let's say hypothetically we were going to add a bird, um, particularly if it was, you know, hypothetically uh, a bird I, I really like, a New Zealand mountain parrot called a kea. 
um, which is absolutely my favorite bird, and people should go Google them. They're just incredible, incredible animals. The, the problem with it is they are quite different from the animals we have at the moment, which means they need uh, a new, unique animation set, and how they transition between animations is very different. And then they need a bunch of AI behaviors and a whole bunch of stuff like that. What what we think for something like that might be very straightforward, but we actually have to uh, figure it out. So the answer is a, as an, a cautiously optimistic yes, there will be uh, more different kinds of animals, not just sort of, you know, variations on four-legged animals. But it has to be tempered with, uh, does it work and can we without investing ridiculous amounts of effort and, and breaking the game, um, make sure that they, they start working. Because there's no point in us, say, adding birds to the game if they just look terrible. Um, uh, you know, they, they, don't, they, don't, they don't work out well. So we've had exper experiments with a number of different things. And, uh, and yeah, and they've, they've worked out really well. So I think uh, it's a matter of, you know, and then sometimes they haven't. So for us, it's a matter of we try something out, see how it goes. Uh, and if it doesn't work out, maybe try it again or just ditch it. So it's definitely something we have ongoing plans to introduce more and more of as, as time goes on. And I guess the longer we have on the game, the more uh, we can try different stuff out uh, because we've basically got a bunch of other stuff working. And I, I think people will have seen that as we went through the beta weekend period, the game just did get better and better as uh, people find stuff out, they post it on feature upvote. So that allows us to invest more time now in things like you know, birds and whatever, stuff like that. Awesome. Awesome. So cool in here from Cass talking about the map. So can you give us some idea on how you'll keep the map from becoming static and predictable? How we plan on making it have some longevity because it's all handcrafted and not procedurally generated? Well, that's the million dollar question. Uh, and, and I think that's <laughs> the the hypothesis that the uh, the entire project is is to try and test, right? is uh, can you make a survival game that's really based on the base mechanics uh, rather than being based on just shoving constant end game stuff in and on balancing the game and do it in a, a session based way and, and, and make people want to keep playing it. And I don't think I can necessarily say we'll definitively answer that until, until the product's, you know, completely finished and like, uh, you know, a few years or whatever, and, and I think that, um, yeah, you know, it's 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 one of those things that we just have to sort of wait and see how that works out. But but I think that what we've been able to do so far is add things to the game and then play around with them. I'll give an example. Uh, a few months before release, we of the beta, we are. Uh, the, the game, I think, we were, internally, we were getting some pretty bad feedback on it. I don't know if you guys remember. Uh, people were, you know, some people worried, oh, it's not fun, it's not this or that. And the pace of the game was way too fast. So you could essentially get to basically the Tier 4 stuff um, in, in under an hour. Uh, and that was because we'd added the stuff to the game and we were testing it and stuff like that. And we dramatically slowed the game down. And uh, suddenly people were reporting that it was a lot of fun. And so I think that just shows that a lot of the changes that you make that make it really fun and make you want to come back and play the game again can actually be some weird ones around pacing and uh, you're having an interesting goal to go to. And then when you get to that goal, then you have another goal. Uh, and, you know, I think there's, there's games like Satisfactory and Factorio that do a really good job of pulling you towards a goal. Oh, I'm going to do this thing. And then kind of distracting you with another goal on the side. Well, maybe you should optimize your like, you know, steel production. And so you go back and you change all that. Um, and, and I think that is, uh, that's a philosophy that we want to approach once we've got the game and the state we want is, okay, what stuff can we add? And we've said about it before, uh, you know, and we, we tried it out and, and we were originally going to have it in for the beta, but took it out just because of the pacing problems, but things like vehicles and uh, you know, automation and electricity and, and things like that are all things that basically we've got essentially being able to uh, give you those additional layers of the game on top of 
on top of it. I am really pleased that we focused the beta on the core parts of the game. And I think I, I saw people pick up on this on uh, on the subreddits and in, in Steam as well. Some some of the, the super fans, I think, picked up that we were really trying to focus on what the, what the game makes tick, ma- makes it tick, even to the point where that almost hurt us with popularity a little bit because, uh, you know, and that, that comes to back to that the game comes first. I think that we've really tried to focus on, hey, we need to try this thing. We have to answer this question. Maybe um, playing around with this might get us a bit of heat, like, um, you know, Dances with Wolves or um, whatever the, the meme was around the beers. So we'd often make decisions and, and try stuff out because they were important answers that we needed to know, even if we were going to cop a little bit of heat heat for them. Uh, and because the, the beta was the time to do that, you know? Um, yeah, and mm. that if we wanted to have a game and that we were going to be really happy with, uh, then we kind of had to do it. And there was a lot of pretty new stuff that we were trying out with Icarus, and you just never know how that's going to work out. And I suppose inevitably it's always going to be problematic at the start, which it which it has been. And yeah. On the um on the map on the map point, um mm. you know we're we're definitely trying to see how much um sort of mileage we can get out of uh, out of Olympus, mm. which is the map players are on now. But we have other ones being made as well. Um, it's not like we're just uh we're not putting all our eggs in that basket. But it is good to to test out and see how much um. The big, you know, how we that is to the, experience. the big problem we haven't sort of been able to deal with. Originally, we actually planned to have a heap more missions. Uh, sorry, a heap more maps. Um, and, you know, tried to build our process to do that. Even if we'd solved the process to do that, the sheer si- file size that makes the game is ridiculous. So that's a little bit of a problem for us. Um, uh you know, as we add more maps, the game download become can become really, really, really big. So mm. uh, that's probably something that, that will be, you know, there's a, there's a bunch of sort of technical challenges that we'll be looking into going forward. And, you know, that's probably one of them. As we add new content, how do we do so in a way that, uh, you know, doesn't um, fill up a, you know, we're already filling up your RAM. We don't want to fill up your uh, hard disk as well. <laughs> awesome. Um, here's a cool one as well from Cypher. Um, given Dean's experience as a mountaineer, what are the chances we get some abseiling tools for traversing up and down cliff sides and getting down into cave pits? Oh, look, it's been something we've talked about, and I think we even mm. threw around, you know, rope bridges and and looking at some interesting physics type stuff. Um, and uh, I, we we don't have any solid plans on it. Um, there's been a few sort of ideas along the way that weren't part of the original design. Uh, this will probably um, break a lot of people's hearts, but fire was not originally part of the original design um, at all and, and was kind of a, a, you know, a developer tried it out and it and it sort of became a thing. I st- think it started off with fire arrows. Was it Francis who did the fire arrows? Yeah. And, and I think and Mason tried it with buildings or something, I think. Something like that. So that was, I suppose, a developer accident. And we've we've had a few of those and uh and I think they've they've been really good. We're basically one of the team, you know, sort of comes up with an idea, we'll try it out and see how it goes. And there's been a few that we've tried out that we've we've liked but not not pushed forward with. So yeah, there's no there's no concrete plans for that stuff. I, I think it does raise an interesting point around the purpose of the mountains. I think it was really important and I think an interesting I suppose I think fairly new thing in our sort of subgenre is to not make every part of the map a place you can go to, and that allowed us to make really interesting looking mountains, which I think a lot of games just haven't done, but at the same time uh channel the player uh in in an interesting way, and I actually got that idea from having a discussion with Chet Fulzik, who uh, was a writer at uh valve for a long time um and um i am blanking on the name of the studio he's gone to now they make uh surgeon simulator can you remember what they are it's like too early on a sunday morning <laughs> um anyway uh he he was really interesting to talk to just about in terms of design bossa that was it. he went to went to bossa so um 
And, uh, you know, he, he took me through how they designed levels for Left 4 Dead, and they talked about pacing and how the players move around. And, and I'm sure you guys will remember that when we did our kickoff meetings for each of the worlds that we've done, each of the trains we've done, um, uh, the first thing we start up is how we want the player to move around. So it's not like we just sit down and make a cool looking map. We actually think about how the player is going to move from here to here, uh, you know, what the challenges might be from that, what the biomes are. And, and I think that's been a really successful way of, of pulling it through. It's just, you know, we need to get more terrains in the game so, so that people see that more and more. Uh, so that the danger sometimes with, uh, you know, maybe climbing and stuff like that is that it allows you to kind of break some of those a bit. Um, mm-hmm. But I'd be lying if I said I wasn't, there's been a few times I was like, oh, wouldn't it be cool if we could have like ropes go down? Mainly the problem becomes animation, not of the, um, the rope, say, because that's pretty easy. That's just, you know, essentially ragdoll physics. Uh, but animation of the characters, syncing that stuff up is, is pretty difficult. Um, and we want to go through and do a whole bunch of work on our characters anyway. So that makes the, the problem even further compounded. So there's no plans for that at the moment. But I think there's a whole bunch of sort of ideas like that that we've got on the, you know, nice to have that we'd like to, if we get time, experiment with. Uh, but yeah, it only makes in the game if we experiment with it and we think that it's salvageable and serviceable. Cool. All right, here's a, a fun um, looking back at the development process one. What is, a, um, what is the feature slash gameplay that you dreamed of most of Prospectors, but it didn't end up developing, and why? So it's one feature we avoided, and that makes you a bit sad. Oh, I think, well, for now, anyway, uh, we had really grand plans with the orbital um, stuff. Um, mm. You know, the orbital stuff still there as the, um, as the meta loop. Um, and uh, there was a whole bunch of stuff to do with the station and floating around it and, and doing a whole bunch of stuff that we we had planned. I suppose the adva- the, the reason that that didn't end up making a, 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 the cut now is because we knew we could layer that in later. And it was kind of one of the more, I suppose, easier in a way parts to do, uh, but, but not anywhere near as essential. We really did try and focus the project entirely on that core game loop of the planetary survival and then looked at the meta layer stuff as something that we could develop and, and build on as the game goes on. And there's been a few games that have taken that approach. Uh, I think if you look at games that have a lot of progression type stuff, I'm uh, you know, thinking like Payday and stuff like that, that over time they you know dramatically changed how uh, that sort of meta progression is handled between. But I, I was sad that we couldn't get all the, because we did a lot of cool stuff with the stations visually and stuff like that. But the game was just changing too much, and it's you know it's very difficult to build in a lot of that um, uh, meta type stuff when when the game's changing dramatically. You know, for example, behind the scenes, your dropship is actually constructed of pieces, uh, but we disabled the constructing of the dropship. In some ways, we'd get it all working and uh, serviceable. We'd figure out an art pipeline, but we realized we were throwing too much stuff at players all at once uh so you know we needed to be able to deal with that new player experience uh at the same time because if we didn't then people can't play the game and i think if you look at our one of our other projects stationers i think that a lot of people would really enjoy that game but they really struggle to sort of figure it out because so much is required for you to understand it all in one go and uh and yeah you you just you just can't and and i think that the the game can suffer a lot from that so there are a lot of reasons that we cut a lot of stuff out but that, that was one that, that made me sad i suppose the advantage of it is it's something that we can and, and do plan to bring in more and more of as we go along yeah and i guess it kind of leads on so that's something that's been really massive for beta is the large scale changes we've made across the game when it gets a bit more structured with 1.0 launch now that we've taken all that insight um, how does the um, development process change for where what we're looking at and what we're focusing on? Um, well, I think we get to do a lot of stuff. And I think if you look at the games that I like and that I play, that many of them are all still being developed. So, you know, you're, I just saw in my Steam thing now that there's, there's ownable dumpers in Euro Truck Simulator. 
So, uh, you know, I'm looking at my uh, uh, my steering seat and going, hmm, probably time to du dust that off. So I like games mm -hmm. that are continually getting developed and updated. And that's why I always sort of scratch my head when people would get mad. They'd be like, oh, that game's in early access. It hasn't released yet. It's like, what, do you want the developers to finish working on your game that you like? Like, when I... So I've been playing a lot of Barrow Trauma and, um, you know, I hope Regulus doesn't finish making that game you know it doesn't stop mm. because it's cool i want to keep it you know the guy who made dwarf fortress says that he's just or i think it's brothers actually um you know it's going to keep uh developing it uh and and, and so I, I think that's interesting but i think what we tried to do and i'm i'm massively segueing off your the question there a bit but mm. um instead of doing early access which i think was really problematic we said okay we're going to have a, a short sharp period when the game will massively evolve and change tremendously then we're going to solidify the game down um and continue to build it as the and i hate all the businessy buzzwords but you know a game as a service um and and i think that's an expectation that a lot of us have without even realizing it as customers you know think about people getting mad that the valheim dev team aren't pumping out updates all the time you know despite them being a small team like you can't just mm. be be pumping out an update every two weeks, you know. So as much as as much as I'd, I'd love there to be an update to Valheim constantly, you know, it's 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 a big it's a big ask to deliver mm. stuff all the time. But yeah, so for for me, I definitely see that 1.0 as the end of the beginning. That to me is the end of the beta period. It's the end of the game, I suppose, bouncing around all over the place, um, losing characters, stuff like that. Doesn't mean that we stop innovating or adding stuff. Um, it's just the core of the game um, will be solidified and then we'll, it'll be about what do we layer on top of it. Nice. Do you Ooh. have anything to add on that, Don? Um, I really wanted to post a picture of Jack's original dropship editor, um, but I thought I'd better put a watermark on it saying that it was clearly an old prototype just in case he was like, what the, <laughs> the hell is this? I, I really liked all that stuff. That, that would be my one for sure. Um, and the, mm -hmm. the cool thing is, I guess it's not something that we've had to like abandon completely. It's just things yeah, that we exactly. have, have accepted that we have to park to get like to get the planetary loop to where it is now. Um, you know, we had to I think we it's... had to sacrifice some of the dream goals um, temporarily. I, th I think it's still correct to say that technically you have a buildable dropship. It's just that we've built it. There's only one. Yeah, configuration. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. but yeah, so behind the scenes that that's, I think it's still, uh, it's still, yeah, cons you have a constructed dropship. It's just that, um, yeah, we don't let you construct it. Yes. Awesome. All right. Here's a cool one with, um, talking about our weather systems. So we've seen some of the amazing weather effects you guys have cooked up so far, but we're curious, will we be seeing any other world events? For example, various magnitudes of earthquakes, solar storms that affect electronics, Volcanic events, flooding, acid rain, etc. Yeah, definitely. So that's one thing I think that's worked pretty well. Uh, and we originally had a lot more biomes in the worlds, but we cut them down just because they were providing us a real problem in terms of performance and optimization. The more different biomes that you can see maybe in one go, the more textures that have to be loaded, the, the more problems we have on the weather front um, in terms of effects and, and transitions and stuff like that. So. Um, we'll probably see a lot more of that as we introduce new terrains that people can play in because they'll have new biomes and new biomes will have new storms and yeah, but, but also because of the way we've built, uh, the game, we can add uh, essentially modifiers and stuff like that on a, even per drop basis. So you might be going into the same terrain, but you might be fa facing sort of a different, uh, challenge and stuff like that. So definitely we've. I suppose built a really robust system for us to be able to alter the mission that you're playing at the time, um, and uh, yeah, I guess we plan to plan to use that pretty extensively. Well, it's kind of that foundation thing, right? So, so you know, release is really going to um, signal the solidifying of of a foundation of of work that we can keep building on. Like just in talking about the um, electricity system in Tier Four uh, last week, the the proposal of those solar storms came up and that's a fairly trivial addition um so so those sorts of things will be really easy to do 
earthquakes yeah. maybe not so much but um yeah it's 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 well, all really cool stuff to think about i mean because I'd, I'd been thinking about earthquakes the other day but we we can do the effect of them maybe just not the land opening up you know um but that, yeah, so so there's there's a lot of different things that we can try, but I, I think yeah, your point is is kind of you know kind of lines in what, with what we said before, where basically our our process is to come up with a cool idea and then try it out in the game and make an honest decision as to whether or not it's any good. Then uh, you know and that comes back to our games are played, not made philosophy, where we can write something down and design and tell ourselves it's going to be amazing all we want, but till we put it in the game, we 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 really don't know, and, and I think people will have seen plenty of evidence as we've gone through the betas where we had a cool idea, tried it out, um, failed spectacularly, and then modified it to something that was actually half decent. And, and awesome. I think we got good with that process on Station Ears. Mm. There were a lot of things that we said early on with Station Ears, our, our, one of our other products. We were like, oh, we're going to do it like this, and then we... You know, and we were said we're we're definitely going to do it this way, and we we try it out, and then you know we sort of meet a culpa and um go, yep, okay, no, we we probably need to change that. Cool. All right. Um, here's one that's going into obviously outposts. Um, with outposts, will each character that a player has share the same outpost, or will there be a outpost per character? So not an account level, but a character level. Which way will that work? Oh, that's a, a tongue twister. You can deal with that one, Dylan. While I'm still wrapping <laughs> he's going to do this, isn't he? Um, so the outpost, your your account will create an outpost. The outpost is stored locally. Your character will be able to join it. Your friends will be able to join it. Um, trying to remember how that relates to the question. Where's the yeah, written I'm, I'm still trying to, <laughs> I'm still trying to sure, yeah. get my phrasing right in my head. But yeah, but three. If you've got three characters like on an my account, taxes. will they? Yeah, will they all be able to access the same prospect, or will each Carry character the have their own prospect? I believe they'll all be able to access it, but only one at a time. Yeah. So if you have a character on planet, you'll have to take them off to be able to bring your next one down. Yeah. You know, one of the reasons we didn't try out the outposts and the betas is because of how we were worried about how. Um, the outposts would affect figuring out the experience. And actually, there's been a few decisions of things that we wanted to say turn on. Um, you know, off offline play would be a good example of one, uh, because we knew how important it was for the game to get that call right. And the only time we were ever really going to be able to iterate on that was through the beta. So the only time we could really play around and um, do really crazy stuff and try really outrageous things on the core loop was during the beta which is the whole purpose of it so we really tried to keep that true and if we introduced stuff on the side of it um yeah that wasn't um yeah that, that wouldn't have been good <laughs> Perfect. um this one probably is one we've kind of talked about a little before but it was around missions again so uh, are missions randomly generated or will they all be handcrafted like the map um, well, I, I think it's a, a sort of a mixture of, of the two. So, and a, even the map has a degree of randomization with it. And that's something that we've played with consistently over time, um, about how we approach it. And also, if you think about, um, if you think about going on a drop as almost like a cake, um, so we start off with the terrain as kind of this base layer, and then we start layering different things on top of it that makes up your, the drop that you go on. So even though you might be playing the same terrain, we do different things with it depending on what you're doing on your drop. We can load in um, uh, you know, different things that are affecting this drop. Maybe it's storm all the time. Uh, uh, maybe there's uh, different respawn settings that you face. Maybe there's different animal settings. And, and people will have seen uh, some, some different examples of going into the same terrain with um, beta weekends, but having a, a very different experience. So that's, I, so I suppose, even though, yes, it's, it's a handcrafted map, there is stuff that we can do with it. And, and it's the same with the missions. 
yes, even though we sit down and maybe make the core parts of the mission, we can actually fiddle around with that quite a bit. And and that's something we've done, you know, to a limited extent as well, uh, being able to make sort of uh, randomized or variable parameters of both the terrain in terms of maybe, you know, which caves are open and closed and, and which aren't. Uh, I, so an interesting example of, of doing this, but then sort of dialing back, what we originally did with the terrain was we were going to have some of the caves completely closed off. And what we realized was the caves were actually really good. And over time, we started actually leaning into the caves. Um, and, and in fact, I, I just had to think to myself there. So early on in the first uh, beta weekend, maybe even the second, we had the uh, metal ores outside of the caves. And um, totally changed the experience for me the experience of going into the caves um made us go okay let's not have any of the caves completely blocked off so that sort of level of randomization got removed a bit um but again i, I think for the better we, we shouldn't just hold on to decisions and design things that we've made just because we made them uh we you know we have to be prepared to uh roll back on those if it makes sense so yeah uh i suppose long-winded way of saying I think there is still randomization that we can do to the terrains as they get turned into a drop that make it a bit different each time you play it. And over time, I think we're going to be able to get more and more and more, I suppose, uh, variable on that. Well, and also, like, without depending on procedural stuff to generate heaps of content, you know, a lot of work's been done to make the tool set to let us handcraft those missions really really simple so the the designer effort it takes to string together some objectives and make an interesting mission is is pretty low the the biggest impact is probably coming up with a narrative reason for that story and then you know doing things like getting um henry to write lines for it and, and those sorts of things definitely yeah and awesome. and I think people will have seen a progression from that when we first started introducing the missions they were very like more linear, they were very specific. And then actually through a number of ideas directly from the team, we've been able to pull that system in a more, I want to say generic, but that's probably the wrong term, but a more uh, variable way uh, that allows us to, I suppose, better and more easily add mission content into the game with a, a degree of variability. Awesome. Fantastic. Um. Another one here, which is quite good looking at our leveling system and our trees. Um, will players be able to max out their talent or tech trees um, in one particular area or overall? Or will it be you have to be more selective be, um, with your expenditure of your points because there's no ability to purely max out a character? I think one of the advantages we have uh, with the game is being, you know, a uh, co cooperative game. Um, for the most part, um, we're able to sort of not have to worry about some things in terms of that. So, so I do think that our general philosophy has been that people are probably going to be able to unlock most everything eventually um, with their character. That's that's been our, I suppose, general philosophy. Uh, I I wouldn't necessarily say that's a hard and fast rule because. Um, that can be difficult to achieve or even even indirectly yeah so i suppose what i'm saying is we don't have anything against that 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 should be necessarily getting in the way of that happening uh but it doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to fully support it either and i, I think you'll see some trees that do just get locked off where you have to make a decision um you're like i want to be this or i want to be that um yeah because a lot of a survival game are, are, is about how you grow your character. And so that's why we've got to be very careful with how we do things like respecking and stuff like that. Because you don't want to, um, you know, a survival game is about choices and about consequences. Do you choose to do this thing now to help you later or or uh, or wait and, and you know, get a, a different result later on? That is, I think, at its core, a massive part of a survival game. So um, if we just let you, um, you know, re-unlock uh, uh, something and, or sorry, yeah, undo you unlocking something and then 
uh, unlock something else just with uh, impunity. Uh, it, it could really disrupt the experience of the the consequences of the decisions you make as you go along. And I think going back to that person's question before about how do we make the game um, interesting and, and people wanting to come back to it, I think that's a big part of it. It's about making you make consequential decisions. I think if you look at our approach to building, it was the same thing. It was like, we don't just want building to be for building's sake. There's plenty of games that do that. We wanted to say, okay, why, why do you, how can we make it so that you need to build a base or that you're, you really want to build bases as you go do these things? I think leaning into the kind of missions that we want to do with the exotics, which we're really only just sort of scratching the surface on, um, is, you know, because basically you're just part of the first cohort now. You're, you're just kind of landing and, and uh, acclimatizing to the planet, and later on you'll start to get the resources. That allows us to really dial into the, okay, now we've got this cool building system. Now there's a whole bunch of reasons for you to build stuff. Uh, or you've got vehicles, so you know you need to maintain the vehicles. You need to have a building to to do so. And yeah. All right. So one in around our deluxe edition. So um, from Ram says, hi Dean. Earlier there was a mention that deluxe edition would be overhauled. Is this still the case, or if the team decides to go forward with what is currently offered, you can't wait to spend his Dean bucks at the station gift shop to get a nice mo plus you can bring on missions or put around his drop pod. I forgot to mention that we have apparently unofficially made Dean Bucks and Rocket Bucks. Well, Community is decreed. Nice. Um, so uh, I think the supporters edition is actually live, isn't it? Uh, yes, and there is the first mention of it. <laughs> well, you were bringing it up today, so well, it has. Uh, now well, I would say I would say the first mention of it would be the fact that it's on our Steam page. Yes, or you're am right. I just saying that? Yeah. So um, <laughs> you are correct. So. You know, that was something that was brought out. Uh, Big Fry, Big Fry and, and a number of YouTubes, YouTubers, YouTubes, a number of YouTubes brought it out, uh, brought it up. That, and in fact, Valve even directly queried me on it originally. I, I, I called it a deluxe edition. That was my fault. We really should have called it more of a supporters edition. Uh, you know, just because of that. People expect maybe a pro, uh, deluxe edition to be maybe 20% more on the on the price. Um I just didn't like the term season pass. And I, I, so, uh, yeah, um, we we realigned that better, uh, and it's something that we want to add more content to as we go along. Like I said before about additional content and monetization, we're just trying to be really careful as we do that. And I think that not getting all that set up and people who wanted to upgrade having to go through refunding the game and then rebuying it, it was really, again, comes back to that. The game comes first. The development of the game comes first. Everything else was secondary. So, uh, you know, we had to work over time to um, to get that working. And, and, you know, Valve had to do a lot of work uh, for us behind the scenes to get packages all set up and that. So it was it was unfortunately a complicated, not an easy uh, thing to do. But we've got there. Uh, we've got there finally. And we, we, we certainly really appreciate uh, the people who do go out and and get those supporters edition because we don't have a you know publisher uh, pulling us through with this stuff. Um, we did go out and kick tires with a bunch of publishers, but we just didn't um, find anyone who who fit. Uh, so we kind of went in for the scary process of doing it ourselves. Um, uh, it's less scary now because you know we've had so many uh, pre-orders, but yeah, uh, getting those. Uh, Getting some good revenue coming in just gives us the confidence to keep our team uh, really solid. We have a really good team, very expensive team though, uh, you know, very senior team. So, um, yeah, people buying those supporters editions definitely um, help keep us all happy and paid. Fantastic. And I guess if you look at to the um, the builder supporters edition with the next two DLCs included. Um, I guess, how does the roadmap work from now for those coming out over the next stretch? Well, I, I suppose we, we have to make the stuff, you know, that's that's the thing. So <laughs> we've been thinking about it as we went along and, 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 and pull stuff off. But I, I suppose, again, coming back to that, the game comes first. Um, I, I like DLC and expansions myself because my favorite games, I, I want more and so you know i i think of paradox games for me and, and it's like i like the little dlcs sure um but i really want the expansion you know i really want the ones that add a whole bunch of new real stuff not just new models or something like that so 
I, I really like that we've made the plans for the expansions and stuff like that, the chapters. But I do, I, I think our primary 100% focus is just on the 1.0 now um, because we've got to make, you know, that as good as it is. And uh, so we try and, I, I tend to swat away the distractions. So I suppose what I'm saying is there's a whole bunch of cool ideas and things we're working on for those, some really outrageous parts of it as well. But um, it's, you know, we've just, I think it, too many companies sacrifice their game in favor of trying to pump out content. And I don't think that's necessary. I think if we make a good, a really good game, um, the, the making good and interesting DLC and making them financially successful is, is pretty easy, really, beyond that. If we make, if we make the base of Icarus really good, then people will want more content. And um, yeah, that's kind of my approach. Nice. Yeah, I I don't know. Did you want to under explain that one a bit better? Oh, I mean, I think you you explained most of it. In terms of the actual reality of it, once we get into it, I think it's just going to be the uh, the way I've been explaining it to the team is the development over the next couple of months is probably going to be exactly the same as the development over the last couple of months, except with the Christmas in the middle, and maybe we'll be allowed outside, um, yeah. back in the office. But um, yeah, it's like the the once we start to make room for that longer term work to to start working towards those biggest sort of dlc feature things then we can but yeah they're, they're certainly not going to be it's not like release day kicks off and then straight away um we're, we're getting stuck into those we just want to uh, like i mentioned earlier just figure out how much sort of a, a, figure out how much we can do once the game's live and then start to put some um some update cadence stuff around that yeah i mean i think of it as like uh, i've thought of the beta period as like pouring concrete you know we're but... The concrete's still been wet. We've still been able to do stuff and make changes. The end of the beta period is where that solidifies, and then we can sort of build on top of it. Um, and so that, and I think that beta weekend process has been enormously successful for us. I think a, a number of people were frustrated. They were like, "Hey, why couldn't we play between it?" But I'm 100% resolute. I think that there was going to be no way that we, as a you know relatively new group of people all together making this game um uh could have kept it all going constantly all the time as a you know we were trying to achieve what many big publishers struggle to do think of many game uh launches and and uh how they normally go i'm pretty proud that we you know we stayed up we stayed operational uh and we were able to do a really focused period of play and feedback and really carefully analyze that and then go away for two weeks um, and and get ready and go with that. And I think about it like rocket launches. Imagine if, um, you know, SpaceX were doing a rocket launch every day or something. Uh, you know, they don't get the time to go back and analyze and figure stuff out and make the changes. Uh, so, you know, the beta weekends were about us getting a whole bunch of lessons, and then we could actually have a formal process of sitting down together on the Monday afterwards and saying, okay, how did this go? What does this mean? And, and what changes should we make? And it was able to, we just able to get a really good process. I do think, though, it's gone on almost a little long, and that's why I've been resistant of really publicizing, say, massively this last beta weekend. I just feel like the beta weekend's there's a danger of you starting to misunderstand what the game is and just it just feels like a you know frustration grind fest because so much is changing and you lose your character or whatever and stuff like that. And we needed to we needed to end that process and and start uh, the game needed to start sort of growing up a bit and maturing. Also just um just so I can shill for the uh for the feature upvote for a second um part of that process for us just so people know how we use that feature upvote is um some of the team are sort of looking through the feature upvote throughout the weekend you've probably seen Alyssa and they're merging tickets together and, and and wrangling votes and then uh come monday we form that into two lists one of the um the the most upvoted features or the ones we thought were the the major ones that really need to be addressed and then there'll be a whole list of of um less obviously actionable stuff that we'll just provide as like a feedback document to the designers so they're aware of all the stuff that was through there but um the the stuff you put on feature up vote really really counts and is, is really really useful to us um just to have have that stuff written down and also show that it's not just like a one-off expectation or experience like it's something that's um that's being uh considered by a lot of people it's it's really useful 
Yeah, and as we've reiterated over the last few weeks, um, something that's been really important is focusing on, I think as Dean's mentioned, the game experience, the play experience. So, you know, we've had a, I've heard a, you know, a few times people be like, oh, this ticket's been there for ages. And they'd be like, yeah, no, it's aware. But in terms of where our focus is, it's always about that um, play not made experience. And so, um, yeah, everything is taken on board. Um, I imagine every single one of you listening would love to have an ear on those meetings because they're fantastic to hear your feedback getting applied. Well, I think um, the feature upvote thing has been enormously successful as well. Mm. I, I was very, very pleased with the quality and the quantity of, of stuff we were getting through in there. I thought I think it also really helped me because it, it gave me um it made me feel good because I realized that people really kinda got the game, uh if if that makes sense. Uh, it really made me realise that a lot of people really understood the game. Um yeah. Hmm. Oh, fantastic. Right, here's a here's a, a unique one. Um, this is from um Jaquam. Perception of a full release versus early access is very different, and player expectations for content, bugs, and technical issues tend to be high for a full release. This can lead to, e.g., poor Steam reviews. Have you considered releasing as early access to be able to add more content and address remaining bugs and technical issues, or are you going full Steam ahead with 1.0? I just think there's too much baggage with early access. Um, and I also think it sends the wrong message about a game like this. Uh, again, and I'm not a big fan of business buzzword, buzzwords, but, uh, you know, it is a game as a service. That's that's the approach that we've we've been taking. So, yeah. Awesome. I've got two more questions. Um, this is one around our law and storyline. How narrative-driven do you see the story being going forward beyond release? We've seen most of what lore is currently available on the Icarus website, as of small snippets and beta missions. Are you going to make direct campaign missions to follow specific storylines and lay it out? Or is most of it going to be more um, nebulous world-building and require reading between the lines and piecing together snippets? They also think Sol is the best and they want to see him in more DLC expansions. Um... How much do we want to say about that one, Dylan? You'll hear a lot of soul. Um, <laughs> yeah, we give you that much. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I I don't know. I did answer um I did answer a question in in the lobby before, so I guess it's okay to say here. But that the the at least for the game we were making, um, the narrative was there to support the gameplay and and enhance that experience rather than the other way around. Um, and I think that that's where it's really it's really cool for world building. Um. I know, I know. Henry, our writer's got a whole bunch of cool ideas he, he'll want to push with, but we'll we'll really be trying. You know, uh, the game comes first, like Dean was saying earlier. Um, and uh, some people really appreciate the world building and getting really into the lore. Um, I personally really like it when it's left a bit vague and people can kind of fill in the gaps themselves. Um, I've really enjoyed reading some of the discussions in the lore conspiracies channel in Discord. Mm. Uh, but yeah, I, I I I think we'll just have to to wait and see. Cool. All right. I'll do one um, last question, one for each of you. And what I'd like to hear is if you had to summarize your feelings of how the last you know, seven beta weekends are gone and then one thing you're most excited for as we go into 1.0 launch, what would that be? So I'll start with you, Dean. What would be yeah, your quick summary and the one thing you're looking forward to? Uh, summary of what, sorry? Um, how you feel like the last seven beta weekends have gone. If you had to really summarize it as like, you know, what was your feeling about the success of it or you know what you've taken from it what would it be well i think for me the successful part of the beta weekends has been that ability to do rapid iteration and i think that that's something that's really difficult to do in game dev and i think to me it was really heartening to see all that work we put in in the you know preceding years uh to make a game that allowed us to be able to rapidly iterate it even sometimes mm. in the beta weekends um that I think was a real highlight for me, um, and I did, uh, I'm sad. I think our customers understand it. I, I think it's something I'd I'd hope that the um, you know video game media would would look into a bit more um, because I I feel like you know the game media talks a lot about a lot of stuff, but they never really talk about how games are made, um, or at least very seldomly. Maybe because 
it's just not interesting. But I think the fact that we do AMAs and that our customers get that interested in this stuff, I, I do actually think people are really interested in how games are made. So I think that process really worked really well. And um, mm. you know, that's definitely a credit to the team. So I think that beyond that, um, what I'm most looking forward to from that is uh, as vehicles, probably. I think the vehicles mm. will change the game completely um and just you know the component system that we've got for them the way they interact with the building system it's just yeah and and the stability system i just am i'm really excited for that awesome that was great dylan yourself um i think it was seeing being able to see how we could um apply the sort of engagement we had with the community from from stationers uh into a bigger scale game um just because you know one of the one of the funnest things and i'm kind of piggybacking off dean's point about the rapid iteration because like the one of the funnest things about working on stationers was that you could have a conversation with five people in discord late on a friday night and they would propose some some idea and then after talking it out for a bit it would actually be like a workable really cool idea and then that could be worked on that night and in some cases it would be you know people would be playing mm-hmm. it the next day uh, and that um unfortunately it's not quite as feasible in a in a in a game like Icarus but that's part of the price we're paying to have that steadier foundation um i mean station has been has been bubbling away there with sort of monthly content updates for for years now but like now's a good example where if you look at the last blog post for it, they've had to step back and, and do a lot of sort of infrastructural rework at the base level to be able to keep supporting that ongoing building on top of it. I feel like with Icarus, we've got the benefit of we've we've gone in with all the experience from from games like Stationers and we've been able to build that that really solid foundation. So it really is like launch really is a launch pad to just be able to start um doing that rapid iteration on not just like bug fixes and stuff like that, but also quality of life things and content. Um, and just being able to see what we can do with that over the, over the next few months is, is, um, is really what's exciting for me. I get that that's not quite as cool as vehicles, but uh, I think it will, yeah, cool. it will actually result in a lot of really, really, really cool stuff. I love that. Oh, brilliant. Uh, I've, I've actually got one last one here. I want to ask you guys, but I think it's something that both of you care a lot about and it's from Kevity search. So, on the whole, it feels like the game has been developed with a lean towards multiplayer play. I'm curious how much thought is being given to the solo player experience. And I know this is a really important one for you guys. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. Um, I, I think that I, I don't necessarily fully agree that the game has been specifically made for a um, uh, multiplayer experience. Like one of our foundational pillars was it's fun to play alone. I think we've tried to make the game so that you're almost encouraged to play it multiplayer, sure. Um, but I think we, uh, you know, there's a big difference between saying that the uh, game is fun to play alone and saying the game is easy to play alone. Um, and I think that's sort of the difference that we've been pushing for. Um, you know, the game's not necessarily easy to to play alone. Nice. Oh, perfect. Um. We will wrap it up there. Um, a big thank you to both you, Dean and Dylan, for joining us this morning and answering a bunch of questions for us. Um, obviously, a lot more in here we didn't get to today, so sorry if we didn't get a chance. Obviously, limited on time, but yeah, we'll um, we'll go away and have a look. If there's anything in there that we need to pick up and answer, we'll make sure that we um, have some answers for you down the line. But otherwise, you know, enjoy the rest of Beta Week in Seven, and thank you for all hanging out. Otherwise, we'll see you at 1.0 launch. How exciting is that? Woo! Brilliant, guys. No, thanks heaps for tuning in. Um, we will see you next time. Bye. Thanks, everyone.